Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the three main divisions of Stoic philosophy was what we translate as logic, coming from ta logike, uh, which could also be translated as the art of reasoning, the art of argumentation, the art of using words, the art of thinking things through. Uh, so it's, it's a bit broader than what we normally talk about today in terms of formal logic or even necessarily informal logic. As a matter of fact, it would extend to incorporate dialectic, um, rhetoric, you know, all the areas, well, epistemology, all the areas that are concerned with these sorts of issues. And there's a tendency when looking at Epictetus and even when looking at what we possess of, of Stoic authors to downplay this quite a bit and say, ah, it's not really that important. Now, the Stoics did, in fact, make some major contributions in the history of logic, um, but Epictetus is not one of those people engaged in that. So why is he insisting in some of the chapters in Book 1 that it's really important for us to pay some attention to this? Or asked uh, in another way, why isn't ethics enough? It's already a lot of work just to study ethics, to figure out how we should um, realign our desires and aversions and examine ourselves and change things here and there. Why do we have to focus on logic? And there's a good answer from a Stoic perspective, or at least several good answers, that Epictetus is going to give us. And I'm going to conclude by bringing up a passage that's actually one of my favorites. Uh, that talks about Epictetus himself as a student with his teacher uh, getting chewed out a bit over this. But we'll, we'll come to that. That'll be the, the capstone. So if we look at chapter 17, he says that the rational faculty is the one that analyzes, that's the term, that's the way we're translating it there, the autothone, this is a, a participle, so it's, it's the activity that it does. Um, it's, it's the one that can, can scrutinize, can examine, can render judgment upon uh, the other faculties and, and indeed everything that, that is involved in us. doesn't mean that it can do it across the board at all times in a pure luminous self-consciousness the way that some people are, are worried about. But it can, in fact, when it turns its attention to things, it can think about them and it can work upon them. Uh, the, this is a term that we've seen in other places, uh, ex erga zamenos, uh, ergen, uh, or, or erga is works, it's, it's, the, it's the tasks that, that are being done, it is deeds, it's another way of putting it. So the thinking faculty, the reasoning faculty, really is quite powerful. Now, how does it stand then? with respect to that faculty? Does it just automatically work the way it should, sort of like plug and play software? No, that's not the case. And you know, look at the video on the reasoning fact of the rational faculty to get more about that. Um, it does need to be analyzed itself and nothing else is going to do that. It's the reasoning faculty with a sort of reflexivity applying to itself that's able to do that. So how is it going to do that? That's where it becomes very useful to start looking at talogike, at the art of reasoning, whether our reasoning is going well. Do we characteristically make improper inferences? If so, maybe we need to examine our own thought processes. Are we taking in 
information from sources that are probably not as, as reliable as we would like to think that they are. Why are we doing that? These are key questions. And ethics by itself is not going to provide the answers that we need. We require some sort of rigorous examination that's provided by the art of reasoning. Another issue uh, that comes up in 117 and also in, in one, uh, chapter one, uh, book one, chapter seven, we need to examine and understand what Epictetus is calling the criteria. You notice that I've, I've got a spell with a K there. That's not a misspelling, that's just the Greek spelling for it. And the criterion means some sort of standard. It's, it's translated as the standard, usually. Uh, some standard for determining things. What are we trying to determine? Well, 1.7 makes this very clear. We need to develop the power, uh, a capacity, for testing the true and the false, not just taking, oh, that's true, that's false. How do we know? How do we actually know that something that we think is true is true? Um, how do we know that something that we think is false is false and therefore is to be rejected? We need some sort of standards, criteria for that. Certain and uncertain. You know, modalities like that matter. When you're, you know, debating about um, what you ought to do in life, you know, so what seem to be ethical issues, you're going to start ending up in quandaries where just having studied ethics is not going to be enough along, unless you accompany it with, with some logic. And the Stoics did do this in their, their training. Uh, we need to be able to decide between these, these things and be able to have good reasons for the decisions that we're, we're making. Um, and so, you know, Epictetus is going to say, uh, you know, th some, some interesting things like this. Uh, he says, what's the professed object of reason? To state the true, to eliminate the false, to suspend judgments in doubtful cases. Is it then enough to learn this alone? Well, here's a comparison. Is it enough for the man who wants to make no mistake in the use of money to be told the reason why you accept genuine money and reject the counterfeit? That's not enough. What else is needed? Well, the faculty that tests the money and the genuine and the counterfeit and distinguishes between them. Well, that is, you know, the art of reasoning. That is the, you know, when we say the art of reasoning, we're not just talking about something in a textbook. We're talking about a kind of comportment that can be built into a person's rational faculty and carried around with them. He says, it's necessary to develop this, this power. Um, what else besides this is proposed in reasoning? You know, and then we can go on further, and it can get more and more complex. But that's at, at really at, at the core of it. Um, he also points out in 1.8 that argumentation in the hands of the, the weak, those who have not trained their, their faculties, and those who are uneducated, can be quite dangerous. And, and, you know, we see this all the time. People giving all sorts of arguments that on the face of them look to be decent arguments, decent lines of reasoning, but as soon as you examine them, you see the flaws in them. And yet those people don't see the flaws in them, and they think that they're good. And not only that, Epictetus says, they get all puffed up with pride thinking, I really know stuff. And, you know, they become quite dangerous to themselves, and they become quite dangerous to others. Um, so, the art of reasoning really is important from a Stoic perspective. Now, where, what I want to close with is this interesting anecdote that he tells. He says, well, why are we still indolent and easygoing and sluggish, seeking excuses whereby we may avoid toiling or even late hours as we try to perfect our own reason? And he says, if then I err in these matters, I haven't murdered my own father, have I? And he says, where was there a father for you to murder? What then have you done, you ask? You have committed what was the only possible error in the matter. Indeed, this is the very remark I made to Rufus when he got on my case. I'm going to translate it as that instead of censured. He got on my case for not discovering the one omission in a certain syllogism. I said, well, it's, it isn't as bad as if I burned down the capital, is it? And then he said, the omission here is the capital. Or are there no other errors than setting fire to the capital and murdering one's own 
father. He says, to make a reckless and foolish and haphazard use of the external impressions, the fantasia, that come to one, or to fail to follow an argument, or a demonstration, or a sophism. In a word, to fail to see and question and answer what is consistent with one's position or inconsistent. Aren't these error? Aren't these the sort of things that will lead us into all sorts of problems? You're right. It's not the same thing as killing somebody or burning down a building, but it is making fundamental mistakes. And those small mistakes in, in what seem to be inconsequential things, put them into the domain of ethics, they can get quite uh, problematic. So it's important for us, if we're going to uh, you know, adopt this point of view, to cultivate the rational faculty and to do so in some sort of rid, you know, rigorous and systematic way. And that's what the Stoics actually did in their own practice.